Hello and welcome to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues, all from a Catholic perspective. I'm Catherine Hadro in our Washington, D.C. studio. Thanks for joining us. In this week's show, Supreme Court Showdown, can the government force pro-life pregnancy care centers to advertise for abortion? We break down the hearing at the high court. Abortions are safe. We push back against a new study's claims about abortion clinics and this. If you are for choice, you would be jumping up and down against forced abortion. Mm -hmm. So why are the feminist groups completely ignoring this issue? Meet Reggie Littlejohn. Her work to help women in China is making a difference across borders and in her own home. But first, our top story, the debate over abortions for babies with Down syndrome continues to heat up. A federal judge last week put an Ohio state law prohibiting doctors from performing abortions based on a Down syndrome diagnosis on hold. This, as we've seen mainstream media advocate abortions for the unborn who have the genetic condition. The Washington Post earlier this month ran an op-ed by Ruth Marcus titled, I would have aborted a fetus with Down syndrome. Women need that right. Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers, who has a son with Down syndrome, responded to the article by tweeting, when our son Cole was diagnosed with Down syndrome, my husband and I were given a long list of challenges and complications from his doctors. But when we looked at Cole, we still saw lots of potential. She continued, there are countless people with Down syndrome who, like Cole, are changing the world. Last week, Marcus doubled down on her pro-abortion position in a new Washington Post article writing, while McMorris Rogers' choice was the right one for her and her family, it would not have been the right one for me and mine. Joining us now is Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers, the chair of the House Republican Conference. She is also co-chair of the Congressional Task Force on Down Syndrome. Congresswoman, what do you think of how Ruth Marcus of the Washington Post responded to your tweets? It was disturbing. Clearly, Ruth Marcus hasn't spent enough time with people who have Down syndrome. More than anything, I'd like to introduce her to our son, Cole, who's now 10 years old, and have her meet this young kid of mine. He brings us so much joy, and I've seen the positive impact that he has on our family and everyone that he meets. And the fact that he has Down syndrome only makes me more curious as to the impact that he's going to have on this world. And I would like to share with Ruth also the outpouring of calls and letters and emails that I have had from people all across the country that have felt compelled to share their stories also of being positively impacted by someone with Down syndrome. You have been very open about the fact your son Cole has Down syndrome. Tell us about Cole. How have you seen your son exceed expectations? So I was, I was 35 and single when I was elected to Congress and so excited that I met Brian the August after I was elected and we got married the following year and then I became pregnant and what a blessing that was. And then to hear the news that Cole had Down syndrome, that was tough news. He's our oldest, he's our firstborn. You have all kinds of hopes and dreams and Down syndrome isn't on that list. Uh, and, and at the beginning, I remember the doctors sitting down and talking with us and, and walking us through a long list of complications and uh, other difficulties that we may face or that Cole would face because he had that extra 21st chromosome. From the very beginning, Brian and I looked at Cole and saw potential. And, and I have seen Cole exceed all expectations. And I've learned not to put limitations on him because he's defined the odds, I guess, <laughs> or, or maybe people just are not seeing what those with Down syndrome can really do. You know, it wasn't that long ago that someone with Down syndrome w wasn't even taught to read or to, to learn their multiplication table because they, they just assumed that they couldn't. And Cole, Cole's mastered uh, his multiplication table. He's in fifth grade and he's the, he's the kid that other kids in his class want to have on their team because he's so good with his multiplication table. He, he loves sports. He loves basketball and baseball and football. And I just, I'm even more uh, curious as to the impact that Cole's going to have on this world. 
I've heard you say having a child with Down syndrome can be tough, but just because it's tough doesn't mean it's not positive. Can you tell us more about that? And what would you want women who are pregnant with babies with Down syndrome to know? Well, having, having a son with disabilities is not, is not what you dream of. And yet, today I can testify that I am so grateful for Cole's influence on me me as a mom, as a person, as a legislator. And, and when I say that something is tough, um, at times it's, it continues to be tough, but it doesn't mean that it's not positive, that he is having an amazingly positive impact on me and the people that he meets, as well as this world. And that's what I want people to focus on. I am proud today to be a part of the disabilities community. And whenever I meet with someone who has um, a family member with Down syndrome, or I meet someone with Down syndrome, or someone within the disabilities community, I feel like we're family <laughs> because we have in common this understanding of just because something is tough uh, doesn't mean that it's not positive. We know firsthand how positive those with disabilities have on our, on our families and on our communities. We're seeing more states introduce legislation banning abortions for babies solely because of a Down syndrome diagnosis. What do you think of these state efforts? I would support these state efforts. And I, I look at these efforts to protect the unborn as protecting individuals and celebrating life no matter, no matter what that diagnosis may be. Congresswoman, finally, this week also happens to mark World Down Syndrome Day. In your opinion, why are people with Down syndrome a necessary part of our world? World Down Syndrome Day is a, just a great day to celebrate those with Down syndrome and everything that they contribute uh, to our communities. Those with Down syndrome just want to have a chance to prove to the world what they can do and to be seen for what they can offer, to be seen for their ability. So on World Down Syndrome Day, I would encourage everyone to just take a second look. Take a second look at those that just happen to have that extra 21st chromosome and what they have to offer this world. Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, thank you for your time. Good to be with you. We continue this discussion in our studio now with our trusted pro-life expert. Marjorie Dannenfelter is president of the Susan B. Anthony List. Marjorie, glad to have you here this Always week. Always good to be here. What do you make of how GOP Chair Kathy McMorris Rogers responded to those pieces advocating for abortion for babies with Down syndrome? Oh yeah, well she's in a perfect situation to talk about it. It's been her life. I, I knew her since she's come to Congress. We were part of her election and when she had Cole, it was a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, and she from the very beginning said and knew that he was perfect. He was made exactly how he was supposed to be. So it added to her pro-life advocacy. It just is now an extension of her life, mm -hmm. who she is. You know, Cole is now in the fifth grade. He's a Boy Scout. He's a big brother. Mm. She could not be perfectly, more perfectly suited to do what she does in the beautiful way that she does. I'm just so proud of her for being who she is. What message does it send when abortion groups are advocating for abortion for these babies? Well, it is a genetic test for who lives or died, and I think that's called genocide. That's mm. what it means. And uh, we might be afraid of that word, but it is literally what we're talking about. So when we eliminate the disease, well, we're not really eliminating the disease out of like cures and clinical tests and trials and, and real cures. We're eliminating the people with, the, um, mm. with, the, with Down syndrome. That is genocide. And you apply it to almost any other thing that could be detected uh, genetically, and it gets worse and worse, and it gets to be the brave new world that we do not want to live in. We mentioned the Ohio law is put on hold right now, but where mm -hmm. else are we seeing these non-discrimination laws across the country? Well, it's beautiful. They're really popping up mm -hmm. all over the place. I think people are getting inspired by other states, Indiana, Ohio, Louisiana, um, North Dakota, they have all passed this. Mm -hmm. And now um, states like uh, Utah, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania are looking wow. at passing this very soon. Um, it just has a very, uh, a very attractive human you can't resist it kind of an appeal and it is very difficult to argue against. The arguments against it um, sound like they are, which are harsh and calculating and exclusive. And eugenics, which, yes. which you hit on. Yeah. Marjorie, if there are viewers 
watching now and they're expectant parents and they get a prenatal diagnosis that their unborn baby is positive for Down syndrome, what would you want to share to them? What should they know? I think they should know all the can-dos and not only from their doctor the what's going to be terrible. This is what happens um, and it's often physicians who say they don't know any better. I think it actually the truth is there it is a liability induced that it's you know um, it's easier for them to just give the advice to eliminate the child because of the disease they should hear what what the prognosis is there's an average age expectancy of sixty it used to be hmm. half that um, wow. people with downs hold jobs they're actors and actresses they bring joy to the world that's really something for us to think about yeah. especially as we continue to see this conversation yes. in our nation marjorie danen felser president of the susan b anthony list thank you thank you Every life is a gift in this world. That includes babies with Down syndrome. And yet we know unborn babies with a genetic condition are killed at a disproportionate rate by abortion. It's a devastating loss. We've seen recently states take action to protect against this discrimination of the unborn. But these laws are being fiercely challenged by abortion groups. We need these laws to protect unborn babies from modern eugenics. As we mark World Down Syndrome Day this week, we are asking you to take a stand against the pressure from major abortion groups and to protect babies with Down Syndrome. Here is this week's call to action. Ask your state legislators to protect unborn babies with Down Syndrome from discrimination. You can do this by simply going to ProLifeWeekly.com. Again, open up your computer and web browser and type in ProLifeWeekly.com. Each state in the United States can and must protect unborn children from modern eugenics. We need legislation that protects unborn children from race, sex, and disability discrimination, including, but not limited to, babies with Down syndrome. Attacks against these precious babies are becoming more brazen, with a writer for the Washington Post recently doubling down on her position that these babies should be able to be killed solely because of their genetic condition. This is eugenics on full display, and we are asking you to take action to stop it. Ask your state legislators to protect unborn babies with Down syndrome from discrimination. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Turning now to more pro-life news, Mississippi Governor Phil Bryant signs a landmark 15-week abortion limit into law, and a federal judge swiftly blocks it temporarily. The new pro-life law is the nation's most restrictive abortion limit. Mississippi law already protects unborn children from late-term abortion after five months, more than halfway through a pregnancy. The 15-week abortion limit will be blocked during its legal battle. A bill in British Parliament would clarify the rights of conscientious objection for medical professionals while protecting them from participating in medical procedures in opposition to their beliefs. The Conscientious Objection Act 2017 is now in the committee stage in the House of Lords. If passed, it would defend health care workers in England and Wales from partaking in the withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment, IVF, similar fertility treatments, or abortion if they have a conscientious objection. This week, the Supreme Court heard a case on whether or not the government can force pro-life pregnancy care centers to advertise for abortion. The case, National Institute of Family and Life Advocates, or NIFLA, versus Becerra, centers around a California law requiring pro-life pregnancy centers provide information about free or low-cost abortions. Both conservative and liberal justices raised questions about the law during the hearing. Even Justices Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor said they were troubled by aspects of it. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, chair of the U.S. Bishops Pro-Life Committee, issued a statement saying, in part, rather than applauding and encouraging the selfless and life-affirming work of these centers, some governments want to force them to provide free advertising for the violent act of abortion in direct violation of their pro-life convictions and the First Amendment. The United States Supreme Court cannot let this happen. A ruling is expected by this summer. What is the ruling expected to be and what were the arguments presented inside the Supreme Court? To delve into this, we turn to our next discussion. Carrie Severino is Chief Counsel and Policy Director of the Judicial Crisis Network. Amy Howe is co-founder of SCOTUS Blog, a blog devoted to coverage of the Supreme Court of the United States. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. So first of all, Amy, was this a case about abortion or is this a case about 
free speech. This is a case about the First Amendment. What it boils down to is can the government make someone say something that they don't want to say, that they believe is morally repugnant. But it happens in the context of these pregnancy centers that are strongly opposed to abortion. And so it, it really becomes a, a highly charged case. Carrie, can you break down and summarize what was NIFLA arguing, the pro-life pregnancy centers? What were their arguments in the high court? Well, of course, if you're forced to speak against your will, that isn't, isn't true free speech. So anytime there's compelled speech, and the court's considering this in several contexts this term, that it implicates the First Amendment. But there's a real concern about this law in particular because it's not simply compelling speech against their conscience, mm -hmm. but it also appears to be what they called gerrymandered. It looks like this law is only targeted at the pro-life centers. So this isn't something that says everyone addressing abortion on both sides of the issue has to provide certain information. This is, is one step farther where they're saying only the crisis pregnancy centers are required to adv advertise for abortion and uh, the abortion clinics are off scot-free. Initial reports and analysis are making it seem that the justices were more sympathetic to the pro-life pregnancy centers. Would that be your take? I think that's right. I mean, the Supreme Court, one thing you have to remember is when you're talking about the First Amendment, the Supreme Court is very protective of freedom of speech, no matter who's speaking, and even when it's speech that the justices themselves may find objectionable. So they've ruled in favor of the makers of violent video games, people who make dog fighting videos, people who have lied about having won military honors because they believe very strongly in the First Amendment. And so you had a justice like Samuel Alito, who we might expect to be sympathetic to the centers, saying that, yes, you have this law, but it carves out all of these crazy, what he called crazy exemptions, and so it only winds up targeting the pregnancy centers. But Justice Elena Kagan was a, an, another justice who was very concerned that this might be unfairly targeting the centers. Carrie, do you agree? I agree. The, the Roberts Court has been, across the board, very protective of First Amendment rights. So I think any time, again, from all sorts of perspectives, that you're on First Amendment grounds, you're on very strong grounds before the court because they, they want to make sure that free speech is robust. I was reading through the transcript. I myself was not there. And there was this exchange about a Choose Life billboard. What was that about? Yeah, so one of the triggers on the law is that you are providing counseling about abortions. And so uh, Justice Alito was suggesting that it could even be triggered by having a Choose Life billboard and saying, well, they could say, well, look, you're providing these uh, these counseling services. Now you may have to have uh, trigger all of the requirements in multiple languages saying, for example, uh, we are not a, a licensed medical provider is one of the one of the requirements. So this is one of the problems with the just over breadth of this law that seems to be trying to sweep in all sorts of uh, pro-life speech. Amy, Carrie hit on it a bit in one of her responses earlier, but the justices did bring up the issue of gerrymandering, which is a term we usually um, talk about when it comes to elections. What was yes, that point it, about it, exactly? It's been on their minds a lot. The day before they had ruled in a case involving partisan gerrymandering in Pennsylvania, and the next week they'll hear a case about partisan gerrymandering drawing districts to favor one party or the other. So it was something that's been on their minds. But here they meant that they had this law that California had passed that on its face appeared neutral. But as Justice Alito said, carved out so many exemptions that when you got down to who actually had to follow these rules, you really only had the pregnancy centers. This might be an impossible question to ask, but if you had to predict how you think the justices will rule, how they'll sway, what would you say? I think after yesterday's arguments, I'm feeling very confident that, the, that this law has so many issues that it's not just even a 5-4 situation mm -hmm. where, which you often would expect in a high profile right. case of this. It seemed like there were other justices, as, as Amy mentioned, Justice Kagan as well, seemed concerned that this was a law that was unfairly targeting one group. And so uh, I, I do think that California may have to reconsider its policies mm -hmm. after the Supreme Court rules. but. We won't know until June. I, I think that's right. I don't think it's going to be one of these 5-4 nail biters. I think what will be interesting is exactly what the majority opinion says and whether some of the more liberal justices like Justice Kagan try to get the court to write an opinion that maybe leaves open the possibility that other rules that uh, apply more broadly might pass constitutional muster somewhere down the line. Amy Hal, Carrie Severino, thank you both for being here for this discussion. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thank you. When we come back. The nicest thing they would do to me if I went to China would be to put me on a plane to come back.
Meet Reggie Littlejohn, a woman on a mission to stop forced abortions in China. Stay tuned as the EWTM Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. A new report claims abortions in the U.S. are safe, but we're here to say not so fast. Here's this week's Speak Out segment. A report released last week by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine concluded abortions in the U.S. are safe medical procedures. The study, approximately 200 pages in length, also claims some state laws regulating abortion can cause a roadblock to, quote, safe and effective care. Regulations, the committee says, hinder the effectiveness of abortion and could put the patient at greater risk of an adverse event. Just after the report's release last week, pro-life leaders were quick to respond and put the findings into proper perspective. Abby Johnson, a former Planned Parenthood director and president of And Then There Were None, said, the new report fails to look at any medical safety reports from abortion facilities, which indicate a complete lack of focus on basic medical standards, like properly cleaning equipment, disinfecting tools, and failure to provide a sanitary environment. Kristen Hawkins, president of Students for Life of America, also reacted to the report, saying, How extraordinarily unsurprising that abortion advocates release a Friday report determining that a deadly product they support is safe. But you have to wonder how they made the determination since there is no national abortion reporting law requiring that the outcomes of abortion be tracked. I will reiterate, abortion is not safe. Abortion can harm women physically. According to some medical doctors, abortion carries the increased risks of bleeding, damage to a woman's womb, other pelvic organs, and can lead to increased risk of breast cancer. Abortion can harm women psychologically, increasing the risk of suicide, drug abuse, and depression. An abortion always, always, always kills an innocent unborn child. In this study, the term abortion care was frequently used. Abortion care is an oxymoron because abortion does not care for a woman, it kills a baby. While this study was motivated by politics, we're motivated to speak the truth here and say abortion is not health care. Remember, you have a role in countering today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com. Ask your state legislators to protect unborn babies with Down syndrome from discrimination. That's ProLifeWeekly.com. Reggie Littlejohn has been leading the charge to end forced abortion and gendercide in China. To put this tragedy into perspective, some estimates claim for every one abortion in the United States, there are 23 in China. Putting a stop to this is a mission Reggie Littlejohn carries in her heart and into her home. Here is this week's Pro-Life Focus. Two women, Reggie Littlejohn and 15-year-old Annie Zhang, were raised worlds apart, but share a number of things in common, from a passion for the piano All right, you can use that. to a love for cooking. The two value the joys of home in the United States because the two also know the ugly reality of another nation. There's really not freedom of religion in China at all. Like. The party, the Communist Party, is like your god. They do not have freedom of speech. They are suffering under a brutal totalitarian regime. And if we don't stand up for them, no one else will. Little John herself awakened to China's urgent problems when she, a Yale Law School graduate, represented a Chinese refugee woman's case for political asylum, a woman who was dragged out of her home and forcibly sterilized. During that time frame, I had two miscarriages myself. And so I lost two of my own children. And I think that because I had, of course, not suffered the violence of a forced abortion, but I had suffered um, the loss of children I wanted, that, I, that the fact that these women were being forcibly aborted hit me on a visceral level that I think it might not have if I had not had my own miscarriages. It was then Little John began to grasp 
the brutality of communist China. The greatest hemorrhage of human life in the world is flowing out of China today. Her desire to protect women and children was only strengthened after working alongside a saint for six weeks in a Calcutta home for abandoned babies. Seeing those baby girls that had been abandoned and holding them in my arms and seeing Mother Teresa's commitment to those baby girls and the faith that motivated her was an enormous inspiration to me. With a new mission in sight, Reggie Littlejohn founded Women's Rights Without Frontiers in the 1990s to take aim at China's coercive population control. She's become the leader on, on the forefront of this issue. Website. These are official Chinese doctors discussing how best to kill newborn babies as they're being born during for, uh, induced labor force abortions. Even though China changed its notorious one-child policy to become a two-child policy, Little John says the Asian country needs to get out of the business of telling people how many kids to have. With the network inside of China, her group, Women's Rights Without Frontiers, helps save women in the womb to widows in distress to this woman, China's youngest prisoner of conscience. She and her father escaped house arrest. They became fugitives. And when they were caught, her father knew that he was going to end up in detention for having escaped house arrest. And so he got word out to me saying, can you please help me get my daughter out of China and to the United States. We've been raising Annie as our daughter ever since. So that was 2013 and she's been with us for about four and a half years. I was really happy when Annie came into our family because I wasn't done being a dad yet. Take it very long, 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 long. That's good. Annie now calls Reggie mom. My mom's work really, it kind of helped me um, convert into Catholicism because to know someone that would just give up basically anything to help these women who are you know, not related to you, it's something that normal people wouldn't do. It has to be through God. And it was through God Reggie's work also reached her husband, a longtime United States Methodist pastor. If I could point to one um, period or one, one episode that, that where I would mark my conversion to the Catholic Church, it would be five years ago this year, the March for Life in 2013. And we were there because uh, Reggie was receiving um, pro-life award. Everywhere I looked, it was Catholic. And, I, and my, I remember saying to myself, you know, where, wait a minute, where are the United Methodists? This family has settled into a new routine. Annie, now in high school, has learned English and has also taken up piano even performing in Carnegie Hall, an extraordinary opportunity early on in her time in the U.S. Though it's China and protection of Chinese women that continues to be on Annie and Reggie's heart and mind. When I was in China, you never really think about it because it's not something that people would like to share because all the brainwashing that the Communist Party gave us. Because I know what's going on in China. I feel an absolute moral imperative, a responsibility to raise my voice because they can't. You could say, like mother, like daughter. That's it for this edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us anytime. Just send an email to prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. I look forward to seeing you all here again next week. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.